The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Welcome to On the Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum, joined by the Cardinal, Andrew Hamilton of TrackWrestling.com. Hey, we have a Cardinal on the show, so it only makes sense. We have the head wrestling coach of Stanford. They're not the Cardinals. They're the Cardinal. And Jason Borelli will be on the show later with us. We yes, both like him. Yeah. I like what he's doing out there at Stanford. I think it's going to be fun to, to pick his brain on what uh, what's going on in the West Coast because we don't hear enough from what's happening out there. So the more we can get connected with that, the more we can improve what's going on in that area of the country. I think we get thinking a lot about the championships that are won on the East Coast and the Midwest. But I'll tell you what, you win the California State Tournament, you're a stud. That's oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So one class. What forty eight guys per weight class? I think they bumped it up to forty eight. I think it's no longer just thirty two. I think they added. Uh, I don't know layer. There. I don't know what it is for the state tournament, but I know like the qualification process to go to state. I don't know what it like. I don't know how many matches you have to win to win a state title throughout the whole postseason process. It's got to be like well over a dozen, I would think. Yeah, because uh, you're talking uh, the highest participation numbers in the country. In one classification. <laughs> it's it's insane. I I can remember looking at Eric Guerrero's record one year, and I think he went 70 and 0 in high school for one season. And that's just match after match after match. I, I hope there's a, a Californian listening to this and can either tweet us or chime in because the California State Tournament's always fascinated me. I thought it was a 48 man bracket. Good chance I'm wrong on that, but regardless one class it's a gauntlet just to get there i think there's two four timers that have three gone. is there three now who Daryl are Daryl Vasquez Mejia and Nevels okay Seth Nevels did it last year Mejia i think the year before and so here a couple in the last 3 years at least and so i could be wrong but i think it's three could we put that in the golden unicorn classification Four times state if you're, champion. If you're a four time California. California state champion, yeah. you're a gold, golden unicorn. Yeah, for sure. So Andy's given the golden unicorn status <laughs> to four time state champions out of California. So we get a chance to talk with Jason Borelli today about his Stanford program. And I just, I like the enthusiasm he has for what can go on in that environment. And, and his is comparable to Chris Ayers. Hey, he has to be creative on how he gets athletes into his program. It's not just the state run school and you get to just pick who you want. There's some standards, but I think what you'll find with these coaches is that they're turning potential barriers into opportunities. And I think that's kind of the rally cry that you're going to hear from these coaches and not, not a rally cry. It's just a, a great way to run your program and Chris Ayers. And I think we're going to hear out of Jason Brelli that he thinks the same way. Yeah, and and I go back to three years ago covering the Rose Bowl, Iowa and Stanford, and the lead up to that, I did a story about Stanford's recruiting and how different it is from most schools across the country. And you look at like a rivals dot com top one hundred list, and I think one of their guys was telling me right out of the gate, you can pretty much cross off about eighty five percent of the athletes just because they can't get into Stanford, and then you take your chances on the the other 15 and you're probably not going to get all 15 of those guys. And so, so that's a little harder, but uh, as you mentioned, I think you can spin it around to a positive and you know, if you're at Stanford, you're probably not running into academic liabilities, probably dealing with some high character, high char character athletes who have their, have their stuff together and you know, they have their priorities in line and you, know, you don't have to deal with some of maybe the discipline issues that maybe other coaches have to. And it's good with Stanford right now, just with the addition of Fresno State, and you're just seeing Cal State Bakersfield ho hopefully getting on solid footing that you're just going to have more and more programs for those teams to compete against. You have Arizona State out there. Unfortunately, the Fresno State is in the Big 12, so that 
takes a little bit of the the edge away of them being in the Pac-12. But it's fun to see these California schools really making some noise because Fresno State, I think, got on the radar way faster than I thought they would as far as just seeing them in international competitions. How many times did we see them at the World Team Trials with a club guy and with Joe Cologne being part of the club at Fresno State just elevating that program? So Jason Chamberlain? Chamberlain, yeah, great yeah. point. Uh, you, you've just seen Fresno State just being talked about way quicker than I thought they were going to, and credit to Troy Steiner on making that happen. Well, they're in a they're in a great situation, a great spot. With you talk about the amount of talent right there in like a fifty mile radius of their campus, with uh, programs in Clovis being nationally ranked in the top ten on a regular basis. And we mentioned Seth Nevels; he came out of there. He's going to Penn State, but. Uh, you got a pretty good opportunity just to recruit really close to home and get good athletes. And they got some, some good wrestlers on the way coming next year. Fresno state does, but uh, that, and I think that there's a strong, strong following for wrestling out there in that area. And so a lot of, a lot of pieces to the puzzle in place there. And, and, as I mentioned, the, the highest participation numbers in the country, and not everybody's going to get into Stanford. Very few of them are going to get into Stanford. Very few of them are going to get into Cal Poly. And so you start looking at the opportunities to wrestle in the state of California, and there, there just aren't a lot of them. So we need wrestling out in California. We need more Division One programs. Cal Baptist coming on the way is certainly a positive. But, uh, you know, hopefully there are some people out there. We, we talked to uh, – was it Wayne Boyd on our show that talked about wanting to get a D1 program at UCLA or USC? It was Wayne. Yep, that's yeah. correct. And so with the Olympics coming to LA in 2028, hopefully we can, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big dream, but hopefully uh, one day we can see wrestling back at those schools. Stick around for that interview. Jason Borelli, head wrestling coach at Stanford, will be on the program. And if you listen to the program, make sure you go over and listen to the interview Andy did with Yanni Diakamahalis, the Greek freak, true freshman NCAA champion last year, had his first match against the University of Northern Iowa and looked very solid in his debut on the season. And that's one of the topics I want to discuss is the idea of a lock NCAA champion. There's been four Division One four four-time NCAA champions, and I think I have a tendency to do this. And, and just take Spencer Lee as an example or Yanni as an example. I've kind of just almost said they're going to be a lock. And wow. I think it's, it's pretty standard. I mean, what they've done so far, I think that they could be four-time NCAA champions. i got to guard against that because it, the more I think about it, when you go back to the season Dustin Schlater won in 2006, I feel like he had the best true freshman season of anyone in the history of the NCAA. Best true freshman. Lost one match, beat the NCAA champ, defending NCAA champion in Zach Esposito twice, got a major decision over him. Just a solid season as a true freshman. He didn't win it again. Ran into injuries. And so here's a guy that I would have said, how could he not be a four-time NCAA champion? I think he got first, third, seventh, and then didn't place. And so I think me personally, we got to guard against just saying, hey, Spencer Lee, he's so good. He looked so good last year. He's got to win it because a lot of the guys cleared out of the weight class. And so as we take Yanni as an example, I think he's improved since last year. But that weight class has some interesting components with Joey McKenna, in the mix. I know he wants an NCAA championship, so there's a lot of hurdles to overcome. So the idea of a lock or saying that winning four is going to be easy, I never, it's never going to be easy. I never want it to come across like that, but there's so many factors that go into it. And Spencer Lee and Yanni have one down, but the three to go are, it's pretty hard to do. Yeah, no doubt. And look at, uh, look at last year with Nolf, even. And, Granted, he won the he won the national title, but there were probably what there's about a month of uncertainty there. You know, he's yeah. in one position, see a pop in his knee, all of a sudden, like one of the heaviest favorites in college wrestling. You're starting to wonder, is he even going to be back this season? 
I would have said after that injury, I would have said he's not going to win it that year. Just the way he looked. It's incredible that he was able to come back and win it. <laughs> it's one of the best comeback stories. I, I'd put it on par with Jordan Burroughs in what year, 2013, when he won yeah. the world championships. Broken ankle. Yeah, broken ankle. <laughs> Even getting the bronze the, the next year. So that that was a, an incredible run for him to do that and to get to that level. And, again, we we brought up uh, – Vincenzo Joseph, he's halfway there, but what does the the next two, how do you get there? Look at Isaiah Martinez, 1-1 one, one, and then 2-2. Two, two. It's hard to do, so I just think there's so many factors that go into it. But all that being said is I, I like the way it was phrased, is that Yanni brainwashed himself to win last year. And so when you're dealing with an animal like that, he's going to be insanely hard to beat regardless of injury. And so with him coming back, having his his comeback match for the season, it didn't look like he had a lot of rust on him. He, he had no. an ability to get in there and score against a good opponent in Josh Albert from the University of Northern Iowa. That's not a slouch. There's a guy that was an undefeated four-time state champion in high school, and he's a senior wrestling at home and – he won that match handily. Hats off to Yanni. And I, I liked your interview with him about that topic because he was able to overcome a, a pretty pretty nasty injury at the NCAA Championships last year and still won it against yeah. Bryce Meredith in the finals. What a what a great story. Yeah, he said he tore his ACL like in a scramble in the opening minute where he forced through a position and he said it uh, was a learning experience. He said a seven month learning experience because he wanted to be out there and compete for a spot on the world team this year. And he said it was kind of tough sitting there watching guys that he had scrapped with, you know, McKenna and Ironman guys that had been in his weight class that uh, uh, he wanted to be out there, you know, competing for a spot to go to Budapest. And I think that there are going to be a lot of opportunities for him in the future, man. The guy's got such a great mind, a great wrestling mind and so mentally tough. And he talked about how he didn't even want to know what was wrong because he didn't want, want to even go there in his mind. He just said, am I okay? And the trainer said, yeah, you're okay. Didn't bother to tell him that he had a torn ACL, but uh, that's my favorite part of the interview. Yeah, I love that part. Yeah. Just that how the, how the mind works because you do have that narrow window. What he has one day to make this happen. One day to be a, a legend for all time. You can either, let him feel like he's uh, injured and can't do this, or you can put him in the, the right frame of mind and say you can get out there and, and win a championship match. And he, he blamed himself for putting himself in that position with yeah. Kyle. I love that part, too, where he just said it was my own fault and I, I had to, to get better at that position and, and learn from that. So we get three more years or two and a half now with, uh, with Yanni, and it was fun to see after that meet. A lot of people know who he is, and – they're getting autographs with him and pictures. pictures. Yep. And that, was, that was pretty cool to see. Here's one for you, Kyle. You talk about Ask Andy, and then we talked about quiz Kyle. I got a quiz for you. Mm. Who handed Dustin Schlater his only loss as a true freshman? Well, I know he's from Central Michigan. That's the only thing I know. Okay. I, I know that. It's not coming to me right now. Central Michigan, I'm just going to go out and say whoever it was placed eighth at the NCAA Championships that year. Is that right? Can we'll you find out? out. We'll find out. You got half of it right. You got the Central Michigan part I right. The Central Michigan. Do I get another third? Would I get two thirds right if you find out? I'll give you seventy five percent if you if he if, plays eighth. If he plays eighth. Okay. Because this, you know, this has to come to me somehow. He did. He placed eighth. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, but I can't get his name. I'll let you have the reveal here. Mark DeSalvo. Mark DeSalvo was the only. I cannot believe you got to get you got the part about him finishing eighth. Okay. That's incredible. Well, he, so that was the only loss on the season. Can you think of a better true freshman season? Now, now we have to throw in because that was always the the standard bear for me. Maybe I need to rethink it. Spencer Lee had a a solid. Freshman campaign, too. True freshman campaign. Imar? Oh, you're talking true freshman. True freshman. Okay. Yeah. And so Yanni and Spencer Lee are in that mix now. I've always stuck with Dustin Schillier having the best season. Spencer Lee had two losses on the year, but his run at the NCAA Championships was absolutely phenomenal. Had the most points of anyone 
team points scored at the NCAA championships that particular season. Uh, Spencer's right in the mix. Yeah. That's a, that, that's a tough one to, uh, to pick. One thing that I think factors in in Schlater's favor is that he wrestled more matches throughout the year, wrestled yep. the full season. And I don't know how many it was, but he was well over 40 matches. But you know how many points he allowed at the NCAA championships his true freshman year? You talking Schlater? Yes. Or? Oh, man. I'm going to say three. Two. Two points. Ryan Osgood, right up the road in Mason City. Okay. Wrestled for Northern Iowa. He got an escape on him. 14-1 loss. Matt Storniolo, former point. former on the mat, mat guest. Okay. Hopefully future on the mat guest. Schlater beat him 5-1 in the semifinals. And then what? 4-0 over Eustace? 4-0 over Eustace in the finals. 8-0. In the opening round, 8-0 over Eric Tannenbaum in the quarters. And yeah. So what's that? 22, 30, 35, 39 to 1. Man. Hats off to you, Dustin. That 39 was, to 2. 39 to 2. He was a, he was a, st- and you just hate it when injuries derail your career. And that's what, uh, what happened to Dustin Schlater. So, but he was in a pretty incredible weight class. Uh, oh. About two years later, when you look at probably the probably the greatest weight class in NCAA history, two thousand eight, talking about two thousand eight at one hundred and forty nine pounds. Just go through that. Tell our listeners right. who the top eight were. All Americans at one forty nine. Brent Metcalf, national champion. Bubba Jenkins, he won a junior world title, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're right. And Jordan Jordan Burroughs placed third. Josh Torello was fourth. Darian Caldwell was fifth. J.P. O'Connor was sixth, and he was a national champion. Caldwell was a national champion. Burroughs, of course, won two. Metcalf won two. Dustin Schlater was seventh. Lance Palmer was eighth. And I think there's some other guys in that weight class that did not even place. That Ryan were, Lang, maybe? Was Ryan that? Lang was a an NCAA finalist the previous year. At 41. Yeah, Jake Pataxel was in that weight class. Boy, that's loaded. And then Bubba Jenkins Ryan didn't Lang win was it in that weight Arizona class. State eventually. So, yeah, just. Bryce Sidoris was in that weight class. He was a Greco world teamer. So Adam Hall. Yeah, that's a class. We're talking that about gauntlets. Ridiculous. That, is a, that is a ridiculous gauntlet. Here's the quarters that year. Metcalf against Palmer, Torella against Burroughs, O'Connor against Jenkins, Caldwell against Slater. So all f- eight of the quarter finalists wound up being on the stand. My hat's off to that weight class. That is <laughs> that is that's our challenge for readers this or listeners this week. Find us a better one than one forty nine in two thousand eight. Okay. And I, I'm gonna come up with one for for next week just to Maybe not better, but I have one in mind that I think could challenge it. So if it's not better, give us one that's going to challenge it. I hope Andy will do the same. So I have Are you going to tease mind. us or are you going to tell us? Well, I'm going to tease you for our next show. But it's going to be the, the 1981 134-pound bracket. Okay. And if you want to go through it right now, we can. Let's I'm, do I'm it. I'm more than willing to. 1981 at Princeton. Yep. All right. There was only actually seven placers in that particular weight bracket. So Jim Gibbons wins it. Yep. He beats a an eventual four-time finalist and two-time NCAA champion in Daryl Burley. Okay. Third place was Ricky Delegata, who made it all the way to the Olympic trials finals in 1984. Dalen Wasman was an Greco-Roman world team member fifth place i think was eddie baza yeah right didn't do much past that uh, claire anderson at six was an eventual NCAA champion your seventh place finisher was your olympian the year before they boycotted in 1980 randy lewis had a severe elbow injury he won an olympic gold medal in 1984 two-time NCAA champion prior to that and then there were guys that did not place like johnny selman was a greco-roman world team member and I think there were a couple other guys that had been previous All-Americans. So 
maybe not quite up to the par of 2008 when you break it down for NCAA champions, but I think that's one with uh, with Randy Lewis being in the mix and being injured and being an Olympian already. I think that that's one that uh, is comparable to 2008. And I'm looking at this bracket right now, and it's sad to see some of the school names in here that have gone by the wayside. Auburn, Arizona, William & Mary, San Jose State, Syracuse, Kentucky, Boise State, LSU, Nebraska, Omaha. Yeah, that's sad. Now you're talking about uh, some others that are now in low, you know, used to be that you could compete at the tournament if you were in, what, if you were in any division, right? If you were a national champion. Yeah. So you had Wisconsin Parkside, Augustana, Boston University is gone now too. BYU. It's one of the hardest things about looking at those old brackets is seeing some of those schools that actually had wrestling. It's hard to believe that some of those programs actually did. Let's make sure we don't lose some of these, uh, these West coast schools and and Nebraska, Nebraska, Omaha is the one that really gets my blood boiling out of all these. It's, it is, it's a, every time it gets mentioned, every time someone brings up that story, I do, I get angry because it is such a, a tragic story and, and how it was done. And we could go into that, but, it would take another hour and we would just be angry and we don't want that on this show. We want it to be positive, but it is, it's mind numbing that that actually happened. It's a really troublesome that, uh, that Nebraska Omaha with, with all the success and they dropped the program right after they won a division two championship. How sickening is that? You didn't even let them bask in the glory, right? (laughs) Yeah. He left him. Trev Alberts left a phone message. Yeah, on, uh, on the night, like during their party, during yeah. their NCAA championship party, they get it broken up. Yeah, terrible. For that news. Well, let's make sure we get to our guest here. We get a chance to talk with Jason Burley. What do you say we talk to our West Coast Connection, Andrew? Let's do it. Our guest today comes all the way from California. We said we wanted to get a West Coast flavor, and what a better way than with the head wrestling coach at Stanford, Jason Borelli, with us. And you are traveling right now. What are you up to? Uh, we're headed down to San Luis Obispo, uh, the home of Cal Poly, and we're wrestling Northwestern uh, at a neutral site. So they're out here wrestling Cal Poly, and we're headed down there to take them on tonight at 5 o'clock, and then we'll head back. So driving down did this dual meet against northwestern come about because gabriel council's father wrestled at northwestern <laughs> no uh but that's you know a good connection no uh we just knew they were coming out here and first talked to them about coming up to us at stanford but um the way the trip worked out for them they wanted to, to just wrestle cal poly so i asked if we came down there if they would wrestle us and they said yeah so just go in there to catch them while they're out on the west coast we figure good quality team like that from the Big Ten coming out. We don't want to miss them, so looking forward to it. What goes into scheduling for you? Being a West Coast team, it is probably difficult sometimes to get competition to come your way. I notice you're going to the Southern Scuffle. Why go all the way out there to compete, and how do you get people to come in to wrestle your team? Yeah, scheduling is a little trickier out West, um, You know, particularly just because we don't have a lot of programs really close to us. Thankfully, with Fresno State adding and, and um, uh, Cal Poly, we have two teams within three hours, so it's not terrible. But, you know, that just makes it a little trickier, um, you know, because teams sometimes want to come out and they want to get more bang for their buck. So, uh, but, you know, the, the great thing is, is we have some unique things that attract people. We have great weather. Um, so a lot of teams in the winter are about to come west and get their guys out of the, the cold and snow and wrestle in a different environment we do some outdoor matches and so we have some some things that um you know we sell when we're trying to bring teams out and uh, we just got to get creative you know talking to the other teams fresno state cal poly um you know other teams bakersfield you know that are, that are within you know reasonable driving distance from us to try to schedule on the same weekend so that teams can can do a friday sunday or a saturday sunday or something like that so it's a little more challenging but not all that bad and then we thankfully have a great budget and a very supportive administration. So we're able to fly and go where we need if we feel like we don't get, you know, if we don't have the best home schedule because of any given year, things can change a little bit. Well, we're able to travel. So our scheduling is never an issue in terms of uh, being able to hit the best competition. It's just some years it's different. Sometimes we might get some great home matches. Other years we don't have to travel a bunch. 
Jason, with that stuff in mind, what's what's the future of the Pac-12 in terms of wrestling? Well, I would say you know there's a strong commitment from the from the conference office, right, to keep the sport to uh, retain the AQ and to try to help uh, strengthen uh, and grow in some ways. You know, the conference they're a little limited on how we can grow. Uh, one 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 position that the conference has taken is that we definitely want to bring an affiliate member in to get us to six so that we can retain the AQ uh, for the national tournament. But in doing that, uh, they don't want to continue to bring affiliates in and go above the six. Uh, they would prefer to keep the brand identity of the PAC 12 strong um, because, you know, they don't, they just don't want to see, uh, they would love for traditional PAC 12 schools to start wrestling. Of course, that would strengthen the conference, but in, in terms of bringing multiple affiliates in, we've kind of been told that we can really only bring one in uh, to get us to the six, and that they don't want to go with more affiliates above that. And that's just a position that the conference has taken and the senior women administrators have, have taken or have taken in um, within the conference. So right now we're trying to identify that six team, talking to uh, Cal Baptist University. Um, you know, two years ago, we had put an offer out to Fresno State. Of course, they declined to, to join and wanted to go the Big 12 route. But, um, you know, tr- tr- just trying to find that sixth school to at least get us to that AQ number and then uh, maintain from there. And then maybe over the course of time, they'll change their thoughts on allowing more affiliates and or maybe some traditional Pac-12 schools will eventually come into the mix and add the sport. So um, that's kind of where we are now. Do you ever feel like you have two jobs, head wrestling coach and everything that goes with that and promoter of the sport? Yeah, I, I, well, I think for sure. And I think, you know, college coaches, that's, that's what we have to do, right? We, we're the most passionate about the sport. We know the most about it. And, uh, you know, I, I think of it this way, right? Like, you know, if you don't fight for yourselves, who's going to fight for you, right? So we have to promote, we have to be out there, um, you know, talking about the product we have, talking about the athletes we have, talking about, you know, how exciting, great sport this is and what it does for people and why it's important on campuses. And, uh, you know, so we do a lot of that. And, and it's, you know, I, I really don't think of it much as other, other than, you know, it's just part of the job, right? We have something great. We want people to see it. We want them to know about it. And we need to promote it, right? And it, so um, I don't necessarily think that it's like, you know, two jobs. I think it's just all one and the same. I've been to Stanford once, and it is unbelievable. The campus is surreal. Does it feel like you're living in a fantasy when you're out at Stanford? Yeah, it is a really nice place. I, I always call it, I refer to it as paradise, right? So the weather's always beautiful. It's sunny and blue skies, and you know, we only have probably 30 days of rain a year. And, and I mean that. I don't just say that as a recruiting plug. It's just a really nice place and uh, consistent with, with the weather and, you know, the the building and the buildings and the campus is, you know, it's really pretty and it, it's just a nice place. So uh, I do think that, you know, it's kind of like a, almost like a paradise. So I, I really enjoy it. The theme as of late has been transfers and you've gone through it. Your dad at central Michigan, Tom Borelli's gone through it in your case with Joey McKenna going to Ohio state. What was that like? Did you see it coming? Was, did it catch you off guard? What was that like when Joey McKenna transferred out of Stanford? Uh, you know, it wasn't, I, didn't, I mean, it was a painless process. I mean, I guess you're losing, you're losing a great wrestler. And so that's painful, but in terms of how he handled it, um, I thought he handled it with a lot of maturity. He was very upfront. Um, he took his time. He was really diligent. Talked to, to myself and the staff. Uh, you know, we had kind of heard, you could tell something just wasn't right from the get-go, uh, whether it was, you know, connecting with people, you know, I, whatever it was, something was miss- missing. And being a long ways from home, there was a, a little bit of a kind of, uh, just didn't seem like everything was clicking on all cylinders. But I thought Joey handled it very good came in and him and I spoke a lot and we talked about schools where it would make sense, you know, given the things he was looking for, being closer to home, uh, you know, just, you know, all the, all the things that he had mentioned. And so he narrowed it down and, and kind of went from there. But, uh, you know, I think it's a unique situation for us. We, we aren't going to deal with transfers very often, uh, right? Most people, you know, I think that's one of maybe two transfers and probably 25 years in the history of the program that have left here from in the sport of wrestling, right? It's just super rare, but uh, I think it's obviously becoming more prevalent across the country, but you know, there's something to be said on both ends, right? Like if, 
if you don't take your time in the recruiting process and you make quick decisions and you commit to places when you're a sophomore or junior, mm, it's the wrong wrong decision, right? You're you're 16 years old and you're making a decision that's going to impact the rest of your life, and it's a big decision. And, um, that's why I just encourage kids to, to wait as long as they can in recruiting, right? Don't commit till you're a senior. You're in control, and it's a big decision, and you need to make a pros and cons list, and you need to make sure you're making the decision for the right reason, not always just for wrestling. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. And um, if you're rushed into it, well, you're going to start seeing a lot more transfers because all of a sudden you're going to get somewhere, and it's not going to be that what you thought it was, right? So, um, you know, sadly, I think we're going to see more and more, but I wish we wouldn't. I wish kids would slow down and and take their time in the process and, and you know, pick the schools that, that best fit them for all the right reasons and not just for one thing. What, why do you think that is, though? As you talked about, it is becoming more commonplace to transfer, and maybe we are quick to put a tweet out about where we're going to school, and then you backtrack. Is that part of it? Do you have a, an answer on why this is happening more often? Uh, well, I think the biggest reason it's probably happened is because kids don't want to lose scholarship offers, right? And that's a sad thing, right? Kids are committing places for financial reasons or because they get told this or else the offer's gone in a short period of time. And uh, parents and kids feel pressured. But, you know, if you feel like if you feel like it's a sales pitch or it, something's usually, you know, I would say when we recruit, we want kids to, to believe in us believe in the school, believe in the vision, um, are coming for the reason. I don't want a kid to feel like he, he was pressured or felt sold, right? Right. So you want kids to feel like they're making the decision where when they get there, even if things get a little challenging, a little tough, that they're going to work through it because they made the decision for the right reason. So I would say probably the only thing I could say is why kids are committing younger and why we're seeing kids decommit or change schools is probably because they were sold on some things and it was more of a you know, hey, we want you to buy this car now. and We don't care what we say. We just want to say it so you can buy it. And then when they drive off, maybe there's some buyer's remorse, right? So um, that's probably the reason. Are you glad you wrestled for your dad at Central Michigan? Absolutely. Yeah, the best decision I've made um, helped me grow and mature in a lot of ways, more so than, you know, not just wrestling. And uh, it's helped me as a coach, um, you know, kind of, you know, I've, I feel like a big part of, our sport in particular is the relationships you build with the student athletes and um, being close to them and, and being the right type of mentors and, and, you know, figure in their life. And, you know, it's almost like you're an extended family member and, you know, having wrestled for my dad and seeing how he treated me and the things he did and didn't as a, as a you know, as my father um, helps me, I feel like be a little bit better close coach for the guys because, you know, ultimately that's what you end up. You almost end up in a, in a situation where you're, you know, you're an extended family member for these kids, and you want to you want to uh, treat them the right way, be fair, but also be hard on them because they have goals, and you got to hold them accountable, right? So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have changed that experience for anything, and um, it was you know, best best years, you know, that I can. I had some of my greatest memories are from that that time period of wrestling for him. So. I've always seen your dad as a truly good person. What is something about your dad that we may not know about him? Um, geez, there's a lot. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> thinking like that you might not know, um, uh, well, you probably do know all the things that I would say, right? He's a guy who's very loyal. He's a guy who's very honest, very fair, uh, uh, holds people accountable, right? Those are the things you probably do recognize because if you, if you view them from afar, those things stand out, right? Um, I would say that, uh, uh, he likes the New York Yankees. He loves watching baseball. Uh, he, here's one. He, uh, Davidson, he's a motorcycle guy. And probably people would never think that, right? Him and my mom both own Harleys and they, they ride all over the United States. It's the uh, craziest thing. I, I ever, I can't even like, it's hilarious to me when I think about that because I probably would never think and picture my dad riding on a Harley, but him and my mom do it. I think a couple summers ago, they rode out to Denver, Colorado, rode back. They ride all over the place. So. What is it about Yankees fans? Andy's a big Yankees fan, too, and he's just <laughs> diehard. He's fanatical. Is your dad at that level where he can't breathe without him? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think he grew up in the era, right, where, you know, the Yankees were pretty darn good when he was little and, you know, Mickey Mantle and all those guys, and it was just a big deal. So he grew up in, in the South where baseball was big, and I think the Yankees dominated at that time, and he's a Yankees fan. But I don't know. But 
Yeah, I wouldn't say. I mean, he, he does go. He's gone to games. He goes out. Uh, he just loves baseball, though. I mean, uh, I like to play baseball, but I don't like to watch baseball. But if you go over to my dad's house, uh, he's generally sitting in a rocking chair watching baseball for three hours and drives people nuts. But he loves it. My kind of guy right there. <laughs> <laughs> What's the greatest piece of coaching advice that you've learned from your father? Um, probably to raise the level of expectation, uh, both in your program, but with your athletes. Uh, I think that was what he did, you know, at Central Michigan. And, and that was kind of the impact he had on guys was that, you know, uh, there's all, you can always, you can always strive for more and, Along those lines, as you raise the level of expectations, you have to have somebody that holds them accountable um, to their, you know, their individual goals. And so, uh, accountability, um, you know, creating higher expectations, those are kind of things that I took from being around him, you know, in a wrestling and a, you know, just in that environment all the time. So, you know, he's a he's a guy who, uh, to this day, I mean, truly believes that Central Michigan can win an NCAA championship and. Not many. That's all you. It's all the messaging is, and that's all that they train for, and that's what they do, and day in and day out. Eventually, you know, starts taking over your mind too. And and he's had some some great runs, right? They've been fifth in the country. They've been seventh twice, and they've had a lot of good seasons. And um, he truly, truly believes that, that they can win the national championship. And I think it has to start with the you know from the top at the leadership. And and um, you know that's one thing that I've always thought was pretty awesome. One of the coaches that gets mentioned as a great coach, he's not even a head coach, and that's Casey Cunningham, who went to Central Michigan. Yeah. Was the writing on the wall that he was going to be this kind of coach that really connected with athletes and could really take you to another level? Uh, well, I think so. I mean, I, Casey, you know, I love Casey. I owe a lot of my um, enthusiasm for the sport to him, right? He was in my dad's program when I was – in high school and younger and I watched him and that was the guy that um, I looked up to. I mean, he was my superhero to be honest, as corny as that sounds, right. I was the guy. And I remember in middle school, writing CC rules of Casey Cunningham rules on my folders when I was in eighth grade. And this thought this guy was, you know, invincible. He was the guy that you go to a practice and he stood out. He was the hardest worker. He'd we'd be running. I'd be watching my dad's practice. He'd tell guys to get up and jog and Casey would be running and literally touching every corner of the room almost sprinting while other guys were just barely, you know, barely jogging and just, you know, he was, he was awesome. And, um, you know, super likable, really nice, uh, personable person. And so I think that all those qualities, uh, led to him, you know, well, he became a successful wrestler then he stayed in the sport. And it's not to me as somebody who grew up watching him and knows him as a person and knows how honest that he is and how, uh, you know, just the way he lives his life. You could you could see him being a very successful coach, so um, you know, no brainer to me. They kind of go hand in hand, right? So he's one of the he's one of the, the true good guys in the sport, in my opinion. So. You served on the Division One NCAA wrestling committee for five years. Does anything get accomplished through committee? Oh, it's I will say this: it's a yeah. I mean, there were things accomplished, but never at the pace you want, right? So. Um, you know, it's a process, and I learned a lot about the, how the NCAA works. And when things, when you have your best chance of getting legislation or changes through, um, you know, but there's a lot of little things, a lot of tweaks to the, but also to uh, how selections are made and the criteria. There's a lot of things that got changed for the better, but I obviously think that it's still a work in progress, right? There's always little things that can be, be changed, but still pretty good about you know, those years and the impact that uh, we had on the championships. One of the changes Andy and I are seeking, and we're asking all of the coaches that we have in the program this question, is just as it relates to dual meets, we think the current dual meet structure is out of touch with three points for a decision, four major, you know the, the whole routine. We would like mm-hmm. to see cumulative scoring where you get whatever you score, a fall's worth 22, a tech fall can be worth up to 21, and really have yeah. some fun with this and open up the doors a little bit. What are your thoughts on possibly doing something like that? Um, I don't think it's a terrible idea. I, mean, I think uh, change is just always hard, right? We've, we've done something one way for a long time, and so you know it's, it's tough on people. But I think thinking outside of the box, uh, 
any ideas like that are good. I don't know the right answer. I, I do know that, um, you know, this is the, the, the 10 year debate, right. Of, of making dual meets more meaningful. And some argue that they already are because individual matchups matter for athletes postseason. But I just think there's other ways to make dual meets more meaningful, uh, more exciting and, uh, to make, you know, every athlete and everyone part of the, the team component. Right. So, uh, Maybe maybe that would help, right? Because now your superstar is that much more meaningful in your lineup. He can score 21 points, and um, you know that's a lot more than just scoring 16 points for his team, right? So I think there are some things, and there's a lot of great minds in the sport. And if we come together, we could we could uh, probably land somewhere that would make sense. But I think uh, you know what what we battle is just. Uh, you know, we've always done what we've always done and, and we're hesitant to kind of go away from that. But I do think there are tweaks that could be made that would really enhance the sport and especially on the dual meet side, because uh, we just see, in my opinion, a lot of matches that seem to coaches and some programs be not meaningful at all. And I, and I wish that wasn't the case because I, I, I enjoy the dual meets as much as any part of the sport. Some of my, probably my greatest memories as an athlete were, you know, in the, the group, the hard fought dual meet wins because you're with, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 of your other guys who are all playing a part, right? You go, you never know when the third stringer has to get in there and save points for the team. So I think whatever we can do to enhance the dual meet would be really good. What's your best outside the box idea you have right now for moving the sport forward? Oh, man. Um, best outside the box. I, I would like in dual meets if the home team got to choose the starting weight class and then after that it alternated choice. So you didn't have to go in, you know, in success you didn't have to go in, you know, weight class order. You could we could look at it from a tr- strategic standpoint as a home team, we could say we want to start at one forty one and then and then the, the other team could say I want to start at one night or then the next weight's gonna be one ninety seven. And so there's more strategy to it and I think the fans might be a little more into it because dual meets wouldn't get as you know you wouldn't i don't think you'd have the chance to string three or four wins together in a dual meet where it kind of gets boring for the fans you know i think um the duels would seem a lot more competitive because the team score would go back and forth and i think there would be a little more like strategy for coaches you know similar to like a baseball manager putting a starting lineup in who's going to bat in what order you know just some, something like that so i think that could be helpful i like that i i think that has yeah. some real legs to it. I think that could be cool because anything that can engage fans more, I think is, is what we're striving for instead of just slowly yeah. going through the weight classes and then you end at heavyweight and that's it. And you go home. I think we need more thinking like that where we can get more opportunities just to engage the fans with just a creative way like that. That doesn't take a lot of effort. Right. Now, as far as fan support, you told me a story about this, and I, I love this. Todd Sermon, who was killed on, I think it was New Year's Eve or New Year's Day after winning the Midlands, his family is still engaged with your program. Tell us that story about Todd Sermon and his parents. Yeah, so Dave and Linda, uh, great people, uh, big supporters of our program. and You know, they support financially, but one of the biggest ways they support is that they attend a lot of events and they stay engaged. and they're just great, genuine, down-to-earth people, and they live up in Oregon. And, um, you know, I think I shared with you one time, we wrestled, we had a back-to-back, uh, the way our scheduling worked out was we had to wrestle Oregon State, I believe, on a Saturday, but we had to turn around and be back on campus uh, on Sunday for a home duel against Brown, I believe it was, uh, if I remember correctly. And I just remember being up on a Saturday afternoon we wrestled oregon state talked to them i was in the gym talking to them and turned around and the next morning we had like like an 11 o'clock match and first people i saw in the gym when i walked in there was was those two you know they had got in the in their car drove you know whatever it is 12 hours down from oregon state from corvallis down to watch us at home the next day and that's just an example of me of people that are unbelievably dedicated um you know loyal and just uh, you know, true fans in the sense of, you know, they, they love Stanford and they want to support us. So, you know, that's the type of people they are. And it was pretty neat. Is that a way for them to stay connected to their son, even though he's passed? I think so. You know, I think obviously 
um, you know, there's a big, there's a big hole, you know, in, in, in there and there's a big void in their life. And I think one way they can fill that and stay connected is to come back and support the program and stay engaged. And, you know, it takes them probably to a very special time in their life when, when Todd was wrestling at Stanford and doing so well. So yeah, I would, I would imagine that's probably part of it. Jason, when uh, three years ago I covered Iowa against Stanford in the Rose Bowl, and I remember doing a story then about David Shaw's program, and and I think somebody from the Stanford camp told me like that uh, when you go into recruiting, you can pretty much cross off like eighty five of the top hundred guys in the country uh, just from an entrance level requirement, and so then you then you're picking through that list. And I was looking through your roster. I think you got 13 states represented in Guam as well. What What is recruiting like for Stanford wrestling in, in terms of going through the selection list of who you like and, and then, you know, the entrance uh, requirements as well? What What are the challenges and, and what goes into it for you guys? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things, the thoughts on that with recruiting is, you know, certainly there's our challenges, uh, but try to turn our challenges into strengths, right? So, not always look at them as, as challenges. I think the one real benefit of recruiting to a place like Stanford is that uh, when you, once you get a kid on the hook and if you can get them through admissions, they're, they're generally you know, great, outstanding kids and you don't have a lot of headaches. So that's a real positive, right? The admissions office does a tremendous job on vetting the kids once we kind of identify them and say we want to support them. And, um, you know, when kids get in, we never have to worry about them struggling academically, right? So, that, you know, we maintain a very high GPA. There's no concerns there, but but just on the front end, your pool, like you mentioned, is going to be smaller, right? There's just less kids you can go after, but but that's okay too, right? It, you can narrow things down quickly, and you you don't have to spend your time, you know, chasing someone to the very end to find out, like you know, you have no chance at them. But generally, we we narrow things down. We get our 15 or so kids in one year that we can go after, and feel pretty good that the kids are very interested because they're good students and they're looking for one of the best education in the country. And so they're, they're very interested in our school. So it, it makes things a little easier on that end. You know, we, we can, we can, um, you know, we can really focus in on kids from a earlier part, you know, earlier, you know, earlier time period. And, um, you know, just don't have to be so many places. We don't have to be spread so thin, if that makes sense. Um, so, but, but I would say we have one of the, I would argue the most unique and difficult admissions process is simply because we have a true admissions where we can't ever guarantee a kid, you know, to, to get in. So that makes it a little trickier. Whereas some other high academic schools can probably use slots and stuff like that. So it's a little trickier for us because we have to wait till the very, very end and wait till the Dean of admissions says yes or no, no matter how bad we want a kid. And that can be stressful. So that's challenging. But, but other than that, I think we have some real positives, even though we have such a kind of uh, focused uh, pool of candidates. And some of these wrestling hungry states like uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Iowa, you get some of these coaches. And we'll use Iowa as an example. Kevin Dresser, Doug Schwab, Tom Brands, they go to a wrestling event and they can't walk two feet without, without someone recognizing them. If you go to the California State Championships, is that the same way for you? Do people recognize you? Do they want to interact with you? Uh, well, I'd say now. I mean, after 11 years in the state, right, I feel like I have a pretty good relationship with a handful of you know, certain coaches and, um, and programs. And so you see them and whether it's through camps or clinics or just, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, a lot of people uh, because of how long I've been in the state now, which is crazy. I think this is my 11th year, but, um, <clears throat> but probably, probably not to the level of some of those other coaches for a number of reasons. One, our teams haven't done as well, right. Um, you know, dressers trophied and brands and teams have won national titles. So you're just, they're at a different level in their coaching right now. Um, and so, you know, you're not as big of a name in the in the coaching world just yet. But also, too, because so few of the kids in the state of California realistically have a chance to get into Stanford, it kind of keeps us at a distance from people getting really excited about it. Whereas in, you know, Iowa, at Iowa State or Iowa, um, all those kids typically potentially could go to those schools. So, um and I'm not just, I'm not saying to wrestle, but they could go to the school, right? So it, it makes them 
follow the programs a little closer, if, if that makes sense. Whereas maybe people don't follow Stanford quite as close because there's just less people in the state that view it as a viable option. Is that I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, from an from an academic standpoint. How do we get more programs in California? It's common a little bit. How do we keep raising the, yeah. the level so we get more D1 programs there? Well, um, money always helps, right? And you have some donors. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think that that's a, it's a great question. I think mm, we need to maybe have some of our teams that we do have have some real good success. And for us and Cal Poly and Fresno and Bakersfield and and Cal Baptist, if we can have success, you know, real success and be in the hunt to win the national championship, you know, I think that uh, brings exposure to the West Coast, West Coast wrestling, and all of a sudden maybe, you know, athletic directors who kind of run in the same circle talk to one another and they start thinking, oh, man, maybe we could add this sport and um, have the same type of success. And so, you know, that could help. I think, like I said before, money, um, and we just – uh, we need to have a, we need to have we need people to see wrestling for you know what it brings right what it brings to athletic departments and I say this all the time one of the one of the reasons that I feel like wrestling aligns so perfectly with a school like Stanford is that Stanford is a place that's about inclusion it's about um, you know providing opportunities for you know for everyone and that's what wrestling does right so the mission of Stanford fits well with what the sport of wrestling does, right? It's a sport that's, that's totally inclusive to everyone, um, you know, you know, from every race, every gender, every ethnicity, every uh, socioeconomic background, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You know, wrestling can be an option. And that's what I love about the sport so much. And I think that's what I love about Stanford so much. Right. And um, so they kind of, they have the same uh, kind of like, you know, they just, they, they align. You brought in some highly coveted guys in this past recruiting class with, with Real Woods and Shane Griffith and some others there. What if, has your freshman class shown you in the first several months you've had them on campus? Oh, those guys are, those guys are tough. Um, it showed me that we have, we have a lot of potential in our, our future, and I'm excited about that. Um, you know, uh, we have a couple, or quite a few guys in that class. I mean, Real and Shane were obviously the big names and are having some success right now, but Guys like Tyler Eichens from Anoka, Minnesota. Um, you know, we have a kid named Gabe Bennett, who, who unfortunately, he's from three-time state champion from Colorado, but uh, he's nursing and recovering from a, a surgery um, that he that's going to keep him out this year. But his future is really bright. Uh, Tony Williams from Michigan had a good prep career. We have a kid in our lineup right now, Colby Harlan, who was a state runner up in California. I mean, we just have we have a lot of good young guys and. It really excites me. That mixed with the class we just signed uh, just gets me really fired up for what the next, you know, next couple of years could hold. But we got to keep getting better, right? So it's not where we are now. It's where we're going to be, you know, in, in the coming years. And we've just got to keep working every day and, and, and moving forward. And these, are, these guys have the right attitudes, and they, they definitely are doing that. So. You've had some uh, pretty strong Gre- Greco wrestlers out there with the mangoes and uh sure. uh, townsville and and so on and so forth and, and you bring in nate angle yeah. what does the future of the california rtc look like yeah we well we we love coach angle he's doing a great job he's you know tremendous addition to the team and he's going to really help our regional training center um you know whether it's on the greco side the freestyle side you know we we uh we believe in both right and and obviously nate has tremendous background at greco and um, so I only imagine, you know, where we're going to go in, the, in that side of things. But I think, you know, we have, we have a lot of, you know, kind of, we have a big, big vision for the RTC just as a whole on both sides and excited about that. But Greco is just, I think, you know, people, for whatever reason, I've always appreciated it because, um, you know, it's a skill set that's necessary, right? You have to be able to put your hands on the guys. You need to feel comfortable there. You need to engage in contact. And I think um, there's some great, skills and crossovers that, that bode well for college. And so, you know, we, we really believe in it and um, we'd like to, we'd like to continue to make that a big part of the RTC. Um, I know a couple RTCs out there are trying to do that as well, but we want to work closely with USA wrestling and try to establish a great relationship between you know, the California RTC and Greco, but, but not, you know, and not take away from freestyle either. Right. We want it. We want that as well. 
Can you unlock one of the great mysteries of my life, and that is why is the Pac-12 tournament one week before all of the other conference tournaments? <laughs> no, it's a great question. But, you know, this year is the first year we changed it. We're going the same weekend. So really? We, we finally are uh, – yeah, we moved to March – I think March 9th this year, the, the Saturday or March 8th. I can't remember the date, but um, we're going to be on the same weekend as everyone else. But, uh, you know, there were a couple things that went into that. One is officiating. All right. I think, um, uh, you know, you just you're hamstrung on, on quality officials when you go all on the same weekend. So that that's part of it. Uh, and I don't know that any of these things that I suggest to you are the, the main reason. They all just played a part. Right. Uh, I think also the ability to recruit, uh, wanting to have, you know, back when there were, 10 teams in the conference, all those teams recruited the California state tournament very heavily and wanting to have it off of the weekend of the California state tournament so that the coaches could recruit was a factor in that, you know, so that you weren't having all those teams wrapped up on the same weekend that the California state tournament was happening. So that, that was a part of it too. Um, But, you know, maybe there were other things that I'm unaware of, but I know those came up all all the time. Those were kind of key issues was officiating um, and then, the ability to recruit so all right we we like to play games on this show we have a game for you i explained this game to chael son and he didn't think i needed the explanation but i'm going to it's <laughs> called true or false we give you five statements you tell us true or false the part i want to explain is i just don't want you to say true or false we'd appreciate an explanation behind your answer are you ready to play the game of true or false with my wonderful explanation <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. All right. Can't wait. Statement one, California is a better place to live than Michigan. True or false? Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> um, true. True. Okay. The, the weather year-round is better, and my three boys were all born in California, uh, Carter, Lincoln, and Jackson, so therefore I'll always be indebted to this great state. Okay. Number two, true or false, your father, Tom Borelli, has a better chance of surviving in the cold, desolate winters of Alaska than he does of surviving in the hot, overpopulated summers of Los Angeles. True. He has a better, he has, he has a better chance of surviving in uh, wherever that was you said in Alaska because he's lived in Michigan his whole life and it's freezing cold there. He's ready. Okay. True or false? The Oklahoma State Wrestling Dynasty with 34 NCAA championships is more impressive than the New York Yankees baseball dynasty with 27 World Series rings. Oh, that's true, for sure. Only because I don't follow baseball close enough to even know if that's accurate, so that's one true. <laughs> okay. Number four, at least half your team, your current team right now, athletes only, knows who Stephen Neal is. Uh, you said over. What was? Ask it one more time. Half. Yeah, at least half your team knows who Stephen Neal is. Oh gosh, I want to say true. Um, I would say true because he wrestled in the Pac-12, and I talk about him enough. And um, he's such a still part of the Cal State Bakersfield program. They've got at least half the team got to know him. We're good. Okay, I'm I'm glad that turned out to be true. I was a little worried that you would say yeah. false on that. Final one. At least one person on your team knows that Stanford graduate John Elway, who played for the Denver Broncos and won two Super Bowl rings, was drafted by the New York Yankees in 1981. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm going to have to say false. Uh, I'd say false. And my explanation would be because I didn't even know that until you just told me. Okay. Okay. All right. Hey, that was pretty painless, wasn't it? You you got through that. So we appreciate you playing the game. We appreciate you being on yeah. this show and doing this while you're on the road. That shows a level of great commitment to us. And I'm sure we will have you back on again. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All appreciate right. It. That was Jason Borelli. And as always, for Andrew Hamilton of TrackWrestling.com, I'm Kyle Klingman. You have been listening to On The Mat.
show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.